government uh, one today just released information that 7 million people in the big centers like Johannesburg, Cape Town, Devon, those sort of areas, they are surviving on less than 2,500 rand a month. So it's really tough for them. They don't have enough food to eat. Uh, the families, they can't really send them to school and that sort of thing. Whereas you've got areas where, you know, that's, that's such a small amount, you know, for, for other people. So it's really kind of contrast, if one can call it that. And I've been thinking a lot about this contrast over a long time because um, I just grew up in Johannesburg, where we are now, and uh, I traveled far from Port Elizabeth to come here looking for work. And my journey had so many obstacles, so many challenges that I faced in that search of employment. And just a better life, I guess. I grew up in Eastern Cape, which is, if you fly, it's about maybe two hours from here. It's not very far. Uh, but in a township, a very poor area, uh, with uh, my mother wasn't working. And uh, my father was a taxi driver. So, you know, doing like those com combis, you see, if you see, if you see them on the road. Yeah, so he drove one of those. And when I grew up, it was very clear, a big family, you know, of seven people. And um, he always told us that, uh, you know, after high school, he is not able to take us any further, education-wise. So you need to find employment, or you need to find someone to pay for you, you know, to go to university. So soon after high school, I found myself unemployed. And it's not unusual here in South Africa because young people are the most affected by unemployment, adults having no jobs. To just give you an idea, currently there's about 10 million people in this country who have no jobs. They want to work, they are willing to work, they are able to work, they just cannot find work. Very difficult. And of those 10 million, about 6 million is young people between the ages of 15 and 34. So very early in life. And the challenge for most of them is that they drop out of school. So most of them, they don't have good qualifications, which makes it even more difficult you know, for them to get a job. So about 25 years ago, I was one of those young persons. So I was about 20 years old then. And as I said, couldn't get to university, found myself unemployed, and really was struggling, you know, to make ends meet. And it's during those um, periods where often I really asked myself why my parents are poor, why they can't afford me to, you know, to send me to educate. So I asked myself a lot of questions. I think I can almost say it was um, it was kind of like a period of soul searching. You know, just to find meaning, because it's not good to be unemployed. I found myself questioning, you know, my worth, my human dignity. Because I used to go from one company to the other, looking for work. And they'd say, no, there's no work here. Or they'd ask me if I had experience. But I didn't have experience because I just, you know, come out of school. <laughs> so that was a very difficult period for me after high school. And that period of looking for work took me probably about six months. And I just couldn't find anything. So I moved from an area that I grew up and went to an even smaller area. In that area, what mostly they did was farming. Mostly farming oranges and lemons, like a citrus farming town. I also couldn't really find formal work there. So I looked for work for a while. Eventually I found work as a barman at a hotel. So, you know, serving drinks at a hotel and got a room at the hotel. And as a young person, quickly got used to my work. I was happy. I was no longer unemployed. And I had been told by my manager who employed me that I mustn't drink, you know, during the time that I'm serving my customers. But I didn't listen to that. <laughs> 
after getting used to the job, you know, I started drinking a little bit on the job. You know, as a barman, working with my customers, drinking a little bit of alcohol on the job. Mm -hmm. But I was not supposed to do that. And that cost me my job. After about five months into that, I lost my job. Right? So back to being unemployed, feeling sorry for myself. I made a mistake in life. I don't know how am I going to recover you know, from this mistake. I don't want to go back to poverty where there's no money at, in, at all. I'm struggling, you know, to find a way. It was at that time I decided to come to Johannesburg, to come here 25 years ago. I'd never been here before in Johannesburg. So the only way I could get here was to come here by train because I didn't have a lot of money, right? So I decided to catch a train from Port Elizabeth, that's where I was, on the east side of, of uh, South Africa to come here to Johannesburg. Unfortunately, I didn't have enough money for the full ticket to get me to Johannesburg. So I had money to only buy a ticket that would take me about halfway, right? On the south of Johannesburg in a place called um, Bloemfontein, kind of central, it's kind of halfway. From Port Elizabeth, you pass through Bloemfontein, a big town, and then you get here to Johannesburg. So I wanted money to get to Bloemfontein, right? But I was so determined to get to Johannesburg because I just thought if I get to Johannesburg, I'll be able to find a good job. And then from a good job, I'll be able later to get myself back to school, maybe get a diploma or a degree, and also support my siblings. Because we were seven and I was the third born. Right? So I thought if I can get a good job, I can then help my brothers and sisters get through uh, and get a better education than myself. So I bought this ticket and it ended up halfway between Johannesburg and Port Elizabeth, like I said. But I didn't know anyone in the city called Bloomfontein. And all the money that I had, I had used it to buy this ticket. So when I arrived in this place called Bloomfontein, I didn't have work. All my money I used it to buy the ticket because I wanted to get to Johannesburg. And I didn't have a place to stay. So I ended up at the train station in Bloemfontein. That's the place that I started calling home because I didn't have anywhere else to go. So I slept on the benches there. I woke up and walked every day, knocking on many doors, not trying to find work trying to get a job. And after about two weeks, I managed to find a job at a very small place that sold, uh, at a small restaurant. And I used to come from this train station where I slept, go to work at this uh, small restaurant. And I did that for about six weeks. And I saved enough money to carry on to get here to Johannesburg. Because I was so determined that I only need to get a job back and you know, I, would, I would be able to find a better job. Little did I know that um, it was even going to be a very hard life for me in Johannesburg. So I arrived in Johannesburg in 1992 and I went to my aunt and one relative that I knew here in Johannesburg. So I went to her place, asked her if I could stay with her for a while whilst I'm trying to find work. And um, she was okay with that at the beginning. She said, no, it's fine, you can come. So I uh, stayed with her for about six weeks, looking for work in Jobe. I could not find work because I didn't have a good education. I only had high school. So I didn't have work experience. I didn't have really anything that could give me an advantage in getting work. And after these six weeks, my aunt, she couldn't look after me anymore because she didn't really have a good job. So she earned very little. She also had her family to look after. So she essentially just said, look, it's already difficult for us with my own family of four. You are an additional person <coughs> that is really putting strain on us. We can't look after you. And so I had to leave. But I didn't know anyone in Johannesburg. And that period from about January 1993 to July 1993 was a very difficult period for me. 
And I'm reminded now, we're almost in June, and Johannesburg is quite cold in June. And that period from January 1993 to about June 93, I found myself homeless on the street. So the tool or the imagine that you may do with Louise, you may pass through some of the places that I used to call home when I didn't have a place. It was in Hillbro, it was a train station, it was a tax, and that's where I just slept in the evening sometimes. Uh, I used to walk around downtown Johannesburg, you know, find things to recycle, like bottles. And then there's a place to recycle them, then I'll get a little bit of money, and then I'll be able to get uh, into it, buy something to eat. And the period of being homeless on the streets really got me to know about myself you know, as a person. Because at the beginning, I felt I would still be able to find a job quickly. So I look for a job, find a job, and then, you know, I get a little bit of money and I have a place to stay. But it wasn't to be. It took much longer for me to be able to get off the streets. By then, it was very difficult. Every day you wake up, you don't know what you're going to eat. You must think about how am I going to survive on the street? How am I going to find something to eat? And at the beginning, it was very difficult. Then I got used to it, you know, it find ways to go into a small restaurants you know, or fish and chip shops and either ask for food or get some leftovers there. But what I found the most challenging, and like I said, you know, we now approaching June where it's very cold in Joburg. And they estimate in Johannesburg alone, there's anywhere between 10 and 15,000 homeless people. So these are people who sleep on the street. These are people who don't work. These are people who are unemployed. And most of the time, these people came to this big city thinking there is more opportunities. So they came from a lot of smaller places thinking, if I can just get there like I did, I'll be able to find a way. So, so around this time for me, it's, 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 it's quite a difficult period because I realized there are all these thousands of people that you know, are looking for people to help them overcome this challenge. So I was one of them 25 years ago. And what I found is the most difficult thing of life on the street. It wasn't really the fact that you're unemployed, you broke, you know, you don't have money. Yes, that on its own is a challenge, but you really get to be challenged at a human level, at a human dignity level, where I found myself questioning, what is life worth? Because I'm poor. I'm on the street. Nobody cares about me. I can just die today. And nobody even knows. Nobody even cares. I have no value, you know, to society or to the world. Because here I am struggling every day, you know, to, 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 to make ends meet. And every single day I grappled, you know, with those questions. And ultimately I can really go as far as to say, when I look back, you know, it was really questioned around purpose. Why am I here on earth? Because our life here is limited. And I'm trying to answer that question at that time. Why am I here? Why was I born? What impact am I going to make? What is my purpose? Because it was very difficult for me. Especially when you see people, you know, who seem to be okay. They've got jobs, they've got food, they've got families who love them, they've got people who care for them. And there you on your own, separated from your family, and with that sense of no one really cares for me in the world. It was really very difficult. And for a young person, I was 20 years old, you know, grappling with these um, big questions in life. And that whole period was about six months of struggling. No money, struggling to eat. It's dangerous on the streets, especially at night. You can be attacked, you can be mad. You know, it's cold and you don't really have things to keep you warm. So it was a very challenging. Although sometimes we had organizations that would come, like church organizations, and they would give us a piece of bread and hot soup and that sort of thing. But generally, it was really, very difficult to survive. So how did I survive? Because here I am, I'm telling you the story. I'm a different person to what I was 25 years ago. So this is what happened. So after about maybe six and a half months of really struggling like this, 
One day, I was just walking, in, as I did every day, in downtown Jobe, thinking about how am I going to overcome this problem? You know, sometimes, I don't know if you've ever faced a big problem, you know, a huge challenge, that sometimes you realize you're not going to be able to overcome it yourself. You need help. You need someone or something must happen. On your own, you no longer can help yourself. And I was in that situation because I didn't have money. I couldn't find a job. I couldn't get myself out of that situation. So I go to a stage where I just accepted that, you know, this is a very difficult situation. I don't know how am I going to get out of it. I'm not just fight every day to just remain positive. In other words, you know, to just believe that somehow I will overcome it. I don't need to know exactly how. You know, I go to that stage where I just said, I don't know. I, almost like I surrendered. Just every day I wake up, I'll be grateful. Just that, oh, I'm happy. I'm alive. It's a new day. If I can find something to eat, I'll be happy. Uh, if I'm not attacked by anyone, I'm happy. You know, if I can walk, use my legs, I'm happy. You know, it, it, it was such a simple life of just waking up and being grateful. That's it. And in fact, I must pause and share with you that, you know, since then, every day, I have this habit where I just wake up and I find three things, just three, to be grateful about. So like now it's cold. So I say, today I said, I'm grateful. I've got food to eat. I'm grateful. I've got a warm place. I'm grateful I've got a job. I'm grateful I've got an opportunity to meet people from different countries and talk to them, you know, tonight and, and share my story. So every day I wake up, I, and, but that started 25 years ago, where I just would be grateful for small things to remain positive so that I could overcome this challenge that I was facing. So coming back to the story, so one day I met this lady. She used to sell in the streets fruits and vegetables just in the pavement or in, in the streets. And one day she asked me, sir, I see you often around here. You know, tell me about yourself. And she used to see me walking in a place opposite where she sold uh, uh, fruit and vegetables. And I'd go and ask for food in the restaurant or I'd just go and get leftovers, you know, something to eat. And I told her my story of being homeless and I come from far and... I just want to find a job or something, you know, to take me off the streets. Life is too hard. And she said, I'll help you. What you can do is come and help me at the end of the day. You know, where she paid the fruit and veggies and put it in boxes and took it to a place. So I started doing that for about a month, helping her do that. So sometimes she gave me money when I helped her like that. Or sometimes she gave me fruit because she used to sell fruit and veggies. Every time she gave me money, I saved the money. And after about four weeks or so of helping him, I managed to save 50 rands. Very small amount of money. <laughs> I'm sure I hear 50 rands buy you two coffees. <laughs> it's finished. That's it. It's very small. 50 rands. Maybe it gets you one of those nice waffles there. <laughs> so when I got to that amount, 50 rands, this lady, her name was Evelyn. I asked her, I said, Evelyn, I also want to start selling fruit and vegetable like you. Where do you buy these vegetables? Is it okay if I sell next to you? And she gladly accepted. And she said, no, it's okay. We can work together, right? So I started selling fruit and vegetables in downtown Tobago. And I remember my first day in June of 1993. Because I had such a small amount of money. I just bought a 10 kg of potatoes and a 10 kg of onions and a 10 kg of tomatoes. And I put them in small plastics and started selling them. Right? And business started doing okay. It was small at the beginning. And as it started to grow, I started adding fruit. So I would buy apples, pears, bananas, strawberries, and started also selling them. And sometimes I would mix them. Instead of just selling bananas on their own, I would sell bananas plus strawberries, maybe plus apples. And sort of slow, but so the business started to grow. Right? <laughs> so it's kind of mixing fruit. And that is how I managed, after almost 28 weeks or seven months of life on the streets, mostly at this big train station in Johannesburg. It's called Park Station. 
So I was there for 28 weeks most of the time. In that 28 weeks, I never passed. I was wearing the same clothes mm -hmm. for that period. So when yeah. people saw me, they would just see, you know, something they call it a hobo here. Someone who lives on the street. Someone who's struggling. And someone, often when people look at those people, someone not worth of human dignity, right? Because they're struggling. And like I said, holding on to your human dignity when you are facing challenges, I learned is the most important thing. And I learned it during that very tough period. So this lady helps me, Evelyn. And I started selling fruit and veggies like her, save money and off the street. But you know, inside me, because it was a big family of seven when, when, when we grew up, and like I said, you know, everybody was really struggling, nobody was doing well, it was a poor family. And I just had this desire inside me to be better so that I can help my siblings, because I was number three out of seven. And so, as I was doing this business of selling fruit and veggies, I always aspired to do something bigger. At the to sell fruit and vegetables, I wanted to do something bigger. And I knew by then that I could achieve something bigger because already I had overcome being homeless on the streets. So I believed in myself. You know, I was optimistic that, man, if I just continue believing in myself and just being grateful, every day I'm grateful for this small business of selling fruit and veggies, hopefully something big will happen. And also I must share with you, by then I learned this lesson of not trying to know exactly how things will work out in life. Because I didn't plan to meet Evelyn, it just happened. So every day I just said, I just wish somehow I can find a way of getting better education. And this was then my dream, that if I can find a way of maybe even selling fruit and vegetables, but you know, obtaining education after high school would be good for me. That's kind of how I thought about life at that time. So it was my dream all the time when I was sitting at my stand selling fruit and veggies. Then as my business grew, I was fortunate. I actually was able to hire people to work for me at other places in and around Johannesburg CBD. So, so just somebody, you give them a place to sit and somewhere to put fruit and veggies and they sell and then I'll pay them. And then another one sitting there and another one sitting there. And I became like a small business owner, you know, selling fruit and vegetables. But I never was comfortable, you know, I never said, oh, life is good now, I've got these four people working for me. I kept on this dream inside me of wanting to help my brothers and sisters by being better, by getting something more than just selling fruit and veggies. And during that kind of thinking about that, I started going to the library. So I got another person to sell for me, and I would spend time in the library. Just, you know, reading books and just, just trying to, I guess, to be up to date with the world. Reading newspapers at a public library, where they would have, you know, newspapers and books and, and, and all those sort of things. And one day in this library, a lady approached me. She just came to me and said, I see you often here. I was there near every day. He said, I see you often here. Um, tell me about yourself. So we walked out of the library. You know, a library is a quiet place. So we had to go out of the library. You can see I speak loud. So I can't speak in the library and talking to this lady. So we walk out of the library. And the first question she asked me, she says, uh, just tell me about yourself. You know, just an open question. And for me, that question, it reminded me of Evelyn. Remember the lady who helped me first who I was selling fruit and vegetables with Evelyn? Because that's also the question she asked me. She said, tell me about yourself. So in my mind, I just thought, you know what? Anybody who asked you to tell them about yourself, they're going to help you. <laughs> so I took my time to explain to her how I finished high school in Port Elizabeth, how I became a barman, how I lost my job, as a barman, how I came to Johannesburg. And now, I sell fruit and veggies and I've got a few people who work for me. And she was listening. And then I go to this part where I say to her, but you know the thing that I really want, why I come to this life line? I want to better myself. I just want to, to maybe go to, to a technical or maybe, you know, like a technical university or maybe go to university. So I'm saying that to her. And she was very surprised. 
that you know somebody who is selling fruit and veggies has this dream of going to better themselves at the university. So she asked me about my marks. So how well did you do at school in your high school? So I told her my marks, and I go to maths, and I mentioned I did B in maths. She said, "Stop! Excuse me, what did you say?" So I said, "No." And now I was, I wasn't like a. Like, what's the word? You know, I wasn't like um, bragging. Bragging, thank you. That's the word. I was just explaining it. That you know, I just dream to better myself. And I just explained I've got a B in math, I've got a B in English. You know, I'm, I was just telling her the facts. And she said, wait a minute. You must be at university. What are you doing selling fruit and vegetables on the streets? <laughs> so I said, but how do I get to university? I don't have the money. How would I pay for it? She says, no, 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 no. Don't even worry about the money. This is what you must do. You know, when she's now firm, she's not negotiating. She's telling me what I must do. She says, right now, please, you need to go, and she tells me this university, it's in Johannesburg. She said, you need to go to Vets University, right? It's in a place called Brafonten in Johannesburg CBT, basically. She said, you need to go there. This was like in the afternoon. I made this library. She said, you need to go there now. Go there, and I'm thinking, okay, but I've got my business. I said, no, no, walk there, it's not far. Walk there, go and get forms, you know, to apply to study there. Okay, so I'm still saying, but I don't even money to study. So I don't want to waste my time, you know, going to get forms. Say, no, 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 no. You don't need money. When you get the forms, go to this other place. So she tells me about this other place, close to the university. And she says, this place is called the South African Institute of Race Relations. They help students get to university. They give scholarships. And I've never heard of them. So she says, get your forms, then go to this place, get the form to apply for a scholarship. And then, of course, you must apply. And then you must come and meet me at this library and tell me if you have applied, right? So I went, got the form to the university, completed it, got the form for the scholarship, and they wanted me to write essays. And I wrote, wrote essays by hand, not typing. You know, found the paper, wrote essays about my story. You know, tell us about your little, about yourself, how did you grow up, what you want to be, you know, when you grow when, when you graduate with just a scholarship to go to university. So I did all that, submitted that. And I must tell you, because I struggled a lot on the streets, and I'd asked a lot of people to help me, and they hadn't really been able to help me until I met Evelyn. So I didn't get myself too excited that, oh, I'm going to get a scholarship and go. I was just like, I don't know, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't. I've got my business, right? So I didn't get myself, because I didn't want to get disappointed. So I didn't get myself too excited that, oh, I'm going to get this scholarship and go to university, or even be accepted, you know, at university. So I was just like, OK, I've applied. Let me wait and see. So I waited for about a month. And this now is happening in around November of 1993. Waited for about a month, middle of December, I get a letter from the university. They said they offered me a place. I, I can study the following year for a Bachelor of Science degree. Oh, okay, I'm happy now. I'm excited, but I don't have the money. So I'm still a little bit worried that, okay, I've got a place good. How am I going to pay? I don't have the money, right? So I went to the library, met this lady, told her, her name was Mrs. Zimmerman, by the way, Mrs. Zimmerman. And she's a lady who just was retired and walked around uh, um, downtown Joburg doing what I call today random acts of kindness. <laughs> she just met people and helped them. She was retired. She just met people like me, and because I got to know her very well, she just tried to help people like she did with me. So I told her, you know what, I've got the place now. Oh, good. I'm happy for you. Let's wait to get the answer for the scholarship. The following year, we are now in 1994. You know, the year we had our first democratic election in South Africa. February 1994, I get the answer. I got the scholarship. So now I have a place to study, and I have the scholarship. So middle of February 1994, I had this amazing opportunity of now going to university. Like this dream has come true. So, you may be wondering, so how was I feeling? You know, because I walked a tough journey. I had been fired from my job. 
I had been homeless in Bloemfontein, you know, that seat I told you between Port Elizabeth and Johannesburg. And I'd been homeless in Johannesburg for 28 weeks, struggling to eat, having just to hold on to believing that I'm a human being. I can't be born to be on the streets. I just want to better my life so I can help my siblings, you know, back home. So I arrived at the university with mixed emotions. Firstly, I don't know why. I didn't want people to know my story. Now I'm sharing it with you now. I don't know. I just felt it's my story. It's a secret. So I never told anyone, my classmates, about how I struggled just to get to university. So that was the first thing. The second thing, after being homeless and struggling, when I started attending class, I was doing mathematics, statistics, finance, computer science. Man, it was very difficult. <laughs> and I had to deep, deep to believe in myself that I could study, understand it, and, 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 and eventually pass and get my degree. But the first half, from February to when we wrote exams in June, every night I cried. It was too difficult. I really had to work hard on my self-esteem, on believing that, man, you know, I overcame life on the streets. I can work hard to understand these things. And I must ask for help. I, I must try to do it on myself. Just like I asked, you know, Evelyn and Mrs. Zimmerman. So I started asking, because I didn't pass well in June 94. The first uh, exam, as a first day. No, I did not pass well at all. So I learned to ask for help. Because now I realize. I'm going to lose my best friend. If I don't pass first year, the condition was they take it. Then I'm back to no university education. So I started asking for help. Then I started passing well. When I started asking for help, believing myself. So I ended up finishing and getting my degree in 1996. Uh, Bachelor of Science in Maths and Statistics. Then I did an honors degree in um, Metal Finance. Then I went on part-time when I was now working. I did a master's degree in finance. And I managed then to help my family. Everyone who comes after me has a degree. I help them to pay for it myself because I value education. And in a way, my story is typical of many black South African families where people struggle to get tertiary education or university education. And then you sometimes are the first one who gets it in your family, and then you help your family. And in fact, it's almost like you're helping them out of poverty. You're helping ending the cycle of poverty in your family. Because if your family continues to be uneducated, you can't break the cycle. So now my sister has a good job at the Department of Labor because she's got a degree. My brother has got a, 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 a degree in nursing. He's a nurse. He's doing well in his own family. My other brother is doing a master's in social work and he's got a good job. So I have money to help everyone in my family because of Mrs. Zimmerman and Evelyn. So what does this story tell us? For me about life, it tells us about the power of the human spirit. That we can face obstacles as, as human beings. But sometimes we don't realize the power inside us to overcome those obstacles. It's only when we're in there, we're homeless, we're broke, we're unemployed, and we have to believe in ourselves, and we can overcome. So that was the first thing. Then the second thing, the power of other human beings to help others, to help others fulfill their dreams, like what Evelyn did, like Mrs. Zimmerman. So we can all contribute to other people's dreams, directly or indirectly. Evelyn was through helping me sell fruit and veggies. Mrs. Zimmerman was through knowledge. She knew where to apply for scholarships. She knew where a university was. So we can contribute to people's lives in different ways and help them you know, achieve their goals. And maybe last for me, I think my journey helped me to live a life of purpose. I feel every day I have a purpose to help others because I was helped by others. I was fortunate. So sometimes I help through mentoring young people so that they choose the right degrees or they make right decisions in life generally, right? Or sometimes 
is acknowledging a person who is homeless on the street. Just maybe looking him in the eye and you are human like me. I feel what you are going through. I may not be able to help you myself, but by connecting, you know, it, there is a beautiful um, expression in a language here in South Africa. It's called Isizulu. So when we greet, we say, Saobona. It means, I see you. I, I, it is, you know, the Isisu language is very expressive. So I see you. I acknowledge you as a fellow human being. We are connected by humanity. We have something common. You know, so when I connect with someone, even though they are hopeless, homeless, I can't help them, or maybe I give them a little bit of money, or maybe I'm coming from dinner with my family, I give them leftovers, I'm connecting with them. You know, so every day I ask myself, how can I be a better human being? How can I help someone in different ways? Because other people help me. And to finish off where I started, every day, starting 25 years ago, I find things to be grateful about. Because let me tell you, even if you're having challenges, if you just put your mind to it, you can find three things to be grateful about every day, even in the midst of challenges. Life has so many opportunities for us that we just need to say, ha, ah, the sun is shining. I'm so happy. I can share happiness with somebody else. I have a place to sleep. I can visit a foreign country. I am grateful. You know, there are so many things we can be grateful about. So thank you so much for listening to my story. So that's my story, one of the thousands of many South Africans and people over globally, you know, who share stories of overcoming challenges because it's within us as human beings to have the spirit to want to overcome challenges. So thank you for listening to my story. I hope you enjoy your stay in South Africa and I hope you lead purposeful lives so that you make an impact in this amazing world that we have.